Uh, thank you all for having me here. Um, it's a long time ago. I, I consider this to be somewhat of an academic conference, if I may. Um, and so this is a long time ago since I talked to academics. Uh, and I hope that I have a, a story for you um, that sort of can take you where, where you find some utility in um, and maybe gives you some ideas about sort of the IT side of things. Um, as, I, as Mark already said, I'm, uh, I'm the chief technology officer for Amazon.com for the past 14 years. Um, uh, you may ask yourself, why, what's a bookseller doing here uh, at the Rights Congress? Well, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, we pioneered a concept called cloud computing. Basically, um, removing the need for anyone to own their own IT infrastructure um, where you can get databases, storage, compute, networking, security on the mount. And so that's become a very, very big part of the Amazon business. And literally millions of businesses around the world are running on the what's called Amazon Web Services, AWS. It's something that you'll see coming back in the presentation a number of times. Um, and, and, and I'm very fortunate that on this platform, it's not only millions of businesses are running, but a lot of nonprofit organizations and research organizations are making use of this because, um, you know, one, one of the concepts around cloud computing is that it, it reduces costs significantly while giving you access to almost infinite capacity for doing compute and research. Um, and of course, I think as, as a research organization, anything that you can do to save some dollars off um, can be contributed to doing research instead of sort of having to fund hardware companies and buying hardware. Um, and so as such, there's a, there's a great match between sort of the on-demand, infinite scale capacity that a cloud computing environment gives you and, and heavy computational research. Because I think most research these days is heavy computational because it, it, it circles around data today. Now, if you think uh, Jim Gray famously uh, called this uh, sort of the, the fourth generation of research, where the first one was thousands of years ago where research was all about observations. Yeah, Newton sat there, saw an apple coming down. Um, hundreds of years ago, in the second generation of research, it was all about theory, making, thinking about theories. And then dead, tens of years ago, the third generation is really focused on trying, trying to find computational proofs for the theories that we've done. But I think everything is shifting today to fact-based research. Basically, everything is becoming data-driven. Everything with that is also becoming computational-driven. So there's a, there's a big synergy between um, organizations like ours, like AWS, who provide infinite capacity around the world um, and, and sort of these new computational research and whether that is done at, at academic institutions or at commercial institutions. Um, and we're very fortunate. There's the, all these amazing organizations uh, running on AWS and making use of AWS. And there might be, on one hand, maybe even for their ERP systems that they're using to connect different organizations together or really actually doing hardcore genomics research. And so one of these organizations that we're really proud of um, that's been a great partner with us for a long time is Erie. And so uh, you probably all know Erie much better maybe than I do, but really the support for the poorest farmers in the world and, and building research programs around that is very close to Amazon's heart as well. And, and we'll do whatever we do can actually support uh, this kind of research. Uh, one of the areas that we're working with researchers around the world is making sure that the data that they do produce can be made available to everyone. Yeah, and literally many of these data sets are becoming so large that it's very hard for anyone to sort of send these data sets around. And there's, there's a great, um, great anecdote about the thousand genome set that I'll come to in, in, in a bit. But more importantly, Erie, together with two other research uh, universities, has made uh, the CK, CK RGP data set available on AWS. This is well over 3,000 uh, sequence rice genomes from 89 different countries. Um, in essence, it's about 30 million different variations that you have access to. And this is a data set that is available for everyone to access on AWS. Yeah, and I think these things um, are crucial 
to actually um, really accelerating research. And we see this across the board, not only with the great uh, uh, data set that Erie makes available on AWS, but we see it across many other disciplines as well. This, as soon as you make this available on a platform like AWS, research truly explodes, because now everyone has access to this data. And the interesting thing is also that you have to think about sort of what format you put your data into, such that um, you, know, you can make computational uh, processing of this very, very simple. Um, and for example, uh, Erie has built a, uh, a web-based interface to the data sets that lives in S3 that you can use uh, to immediately sort of search for all the different variations that you're look, looking for. So it's not just that you have access to the data set, you actually already get you have web-based portals that actually give you access to this data set as, as well. Um, it's great work being done by, by Erie, and we're really proud at, uh, at Amazon that we're able to support this uh, for the open data program. If I think about sort of how these data sets are growing over time, um, it, it, it's interesting to look back at the sort of the human genome uh, program. Yeah, if you, if you remember the, the human genome uh, project started off with a sequencing of one human genome, which literally took 13 years. Yeah, to, to, and the resulting data set of that was actually put on an iPod, which was then sent around the world to different researchers, which could take the data off. And, and of course, the data set wasn't that terribly big. I mean, gigabytes in those days definitely were. But if you then look at how the Human Genome Project uh, evolved, was that doing that one human genome was way too much work. Yeah, it was really, you couldn't do all the genomes and do another 13 years. So everybody went on to doing easier, um, easier animals. Yeah, mouses, rats, things like that. And basically that set got to the hundreds of gigabytes. And then the sort of next generation happened where you get these new sequencing instruments becoming available, where actually sequencing genomes is becoming extremely cheap. Yeah, and so um, the result of that is already getting into terabytes. Yeah, and terabytes are becoming more, it's, it's harder and harder to download just a, a, ter a terabyte of data, especially if you start talking about hundreds of terabytes of data. Because if you look at the 1,000 genome project, the resulting data set is that of 1,000 genomes and actually has 200 terabytes. And again, this is one of those data sets that is available on AWS for everyone to access and to operate on. It drives enormous amount of research. Also, on one hand, because everybody now is operating on the same data set. I think research in the past often happened on your private data set. And maybe your results will be published in a paper, but there were very few people that were actually publishing their data sets also, such that research could be re re repeatable. And I think uh, some side of the whole open data process that we run on, on AWS and, and other organizations do as well, is to drive repeatable research. And so if you look at sort of the different types of organizations that are all uh, putting their data on a cloud provider such as AWS as open data, it can be on one hand, uh, for example, you know, research organizations like the Met Office in, in the UK, or companies like Digital Globe, who do all the digital, who do all the satellite imagery, who actually also rely for a very large part on, uh, on open data. And, and so we do this, uh, make it available for anyone to use. If you go to this website, opendata.aws, you'll find a whole collection of data sets uh, with a detailed description about exactly how to access it, what kind of licensing there are around the data sets, uh, and also uh, what kind of formats there are. Yeah, and so we have um, a quite a number of a wide variety of, uh, of different data sets available here uh, from, the U from the US government to NASA to Erie. Um, to the tax office in the US or different countries. Uh, and this is just a very small uh, a number of these data sets that are available. Um, and, and if you're a researcher who is thinking about publishing and actually thinking about sort of also making your data available, I urge you to contact us and work with us to actually make your data available for every other researcher to access as, as well. Um, the thing is that I think most research these days is really co 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 collaborative. This is uh, jokingly called Joyce Law. He 
Bill Joy used to be the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, a company that no longer exists, I agree. Um, but he was smart enough in, he always said that, you know, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people will work for someone else. And it always means that sort of, you can augment your research basically by sort of working together with other people. However, traditional data acquisition was sort of hard. It was really from tape to boxes to, um, there's so much, so much research funding being wasted in being a sort of indirect funding for the computer hardware industry um, that we really need to move away from, from, from this. One thing is, of course, that already much of this data is actually being generated in the cloud itself. Um, DNA Nexus, which worked with, uh, with Erie on the, the CK RGP data set, actually did all the processing of that data in the cloud. And they used 37,000 cores for two days to actually create, this, uh, to do all the sequencing necessary to actually make this data set available for everyone else. And of course, all the stuff is already happening in the cloud itself. And as such, it's a great sort of centralized place uh, for much of this research to be taking place. A lot of this stuff that I think is, uh, and, and I've been a researcher for a long time my, my, myself, and I know how much time I wasted on what I would now call undifferentiated heavy lifting. Yeah, the, um, I was a computer science researcher. The time, the amount of time that I actually spent um, putting cables together, putting servers together, building clusters, all these kind of things was terribly interesting, but so terribly wasteful from a research perspective. I learned a lot about sort of keeping hardware up and running, but that had nothing to do with the research that I was, was doing. So there's a lot of undifferentiating lift, lifting in and around all this data uh, re research that I think we, uh, we need to really move away, away from. And so the cool thing is, of course, that sharing this data in this one particular location will, first of all, give you a whole set of new services and tools that you need, did not have available before you. And whether that is, um, let's say, the more traditional sort of analytics tools that um, Ado, uh, Amazon provides you with, uh, but it can also be all sorts of partner tools and, and sort of open source tools. Uh, if you're a user of, for example, HTC Condor, um, with one click of a button, actually, you can launch a whole Condor cluster on AWS without, without ever having to sort of uh, instantiate uh, different machines again, ever. And so um, it, it significantly lowers the cost of research, but it also really drives sort of acceleration of research as well, because everybody now has access to the same data sets. Uh, and I want to point out one particular data set that I really like, so this Landsat. And uh, so the Landsat satellite, if you know, um, number eight is, I think, circling the world at the moment. So what NASA did was actually put all the data from Landsat uh, as an open data set on, on AWS. I think this is the 2015 data set. And after that, every new um, uh, image, image that the Landsat satellites produce um, actually immediately gets added to this particular data set. So Landsat is the largest collection of, uh, um, of let's say, um, the view of the land of um, the Earth seen from space. Uh, it's an amazing data set. Interesting is enough that we worked with, uh, with NASA to actually find a particular uh, format for the, the data that contained enough, uh, let's say, metadata and other components in each imagery, such that actually it was very simple to build uh, web-based systems immediately on top of this, where you did not need to run any servers or anything like that. You could just create a web page and point it to this data and then create, for example, uh, a Tyler like, like this, this, this one. Yeah, there is no servers involved here at all. Basically, the data lives in what we call Amazon S3, the simple storage service that is directly internet accessible. And then together with um, some serverless components, what we call Lambda, allows you to build sort of applications like this without ever having to run one server yourself. Well, that immediately brings data in front of every researcher or in every, uh, anyone that's interested in this particular data. So this is a Tyler that the guys from Mapbox built, who are, by the way, is a great group of, uh, of individuals. To really figure out what kind of formats to use 
is really important. So this is actually uh, this is the data from uh, someone that um, actually no normally had to access the data set from, uh, from a traditional environment, moved it over to AWS, and in a much more efficient way, able to process all the imagery because the metadata sits now with the image itself. And actually, sh he shaved off about 250 days of his research by you purely using more, let's say, IT-optimized imagery um, instead of the traditional uh, imagery that comes from, uh, from the satellites itself. Um, there's one particular whole group of data sets, uh, open data sets, that I would like to point you to. This may be of your interest. It's uh, what we call the Earth data set. Uh, and it has a whole set of public uh, uh, different data sets about geographical imagery, and whether that's around climate models or elevation models or satellite imagery. Uh, it's available for everyone to use. If you actually have are interested in doing research with this particular data, Go to this URL, and we may have research credits available for you to actually process, to actually work on this data. Now, I said earlier on, it's a, a large part about this is tools um, that actually are available in AWS. I think we help you get most of your data. We have all sorts of different storage options. I talked about S3 already. And so it is mechanisms where we can hook up a whole set of different analytics tools with um, with the different storage options that are available, and whether those are actually in the cloud or on-premise, we make all of these things uh, available for you. Uh, machine learning is becoming an increasingly important part of, uh, of research, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, in, uh, in a minute. Um, many of you have been running your own hardware and things like that, and we have quite a few researchers who so are all, always interested in sort of what kind of machinery they need to use to do their optimizations. Well, we have a whole family available for you. Yeah. Uh, whether you want to do, was it, multi, massive in-memory processing, whether you want to use GPUs or, or uh, general purpose GPUs, or whether you want to put it onto FPGA arrays, uh, all of this stuff is available for you. Um, hit us up if you want to uh, get research credits to make use of any of these mach machinery. Um, well, one thing I want to talk a bit about, because it's so much so hot at this moment everywhere, is uh, machine learning. And so I I'm not really sure how many of you in the room are aware of what machine learning is. I think it's part of what we call artificial intelligence, and that scares everybody immediately, because you start thinking about robots and Skynet and things like that. Um, it's not. Uh, machine learning, if I think about analytics, there's sort of three different types of analytics. I think there's analytics that looks towards the past, uh, and sort of the traditional data warehousing and some of that kind of an analytics. Um, then there is analytics that looks at the current state of uh, affairs, what is happening right now in real time. Uh, it's, it's, you're not interested in, in your inventory level yesterday, you're, in, you're interested in what's your inventory level right now. Um, and then there's the third part of, uh, of analytics, and that is making predictions. But it turns out we're really bad at making pre 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 predictions. But what we can do is actually take data from the past and then try to make use of that data to make an educated guess about the future. And that's what machine learning is all about. Now, at one moment, data sets are becoming so large that it, and so complex that it's no longer possible for a human to just write an algorithm you actually want a computer to start sort of figuring out what are the most important aspects of this particular data? What are the things that we should be looking for if we are looking for, let's say, objects in this imagery? Or if we are looking for, uh, let's, let's say, maybe doing inventory level uh, planning or things like, 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 like that. At, at Amazon, we have a very long history at machine learning. And if you've ever been an Amazon customer, Amazon retail customer, you've been exposed to machine learning for the past 25 years. That's all the things around sort of that we've pioneered, for example, around recommendations or all the robots that we're running in our fulfillment centers. And then we've done really big sort of new innovations driven by machine learning, whether those are the drones or whether it's Alexa with the voice, voice assistant or recently our Amazon Go stores where you can use, make use of machine vision um, video and machine vision to actually allow you to walk into a store, take things off the shelf, put it in your bag, and like walk out and get automatically charged. All of those applications are machine learning in one way or another. Basically operating on very large data sets and then discovering, um, let's say, what the content is in there 
uh, for you to use. Well, those were all big innovations, but we've been using machine learning all over the place for such a long time. And whether that is things like vendor lead time detection or visual search or product matching, all these kind of things are uh, machine learning driven. However, there may have been many of our innovations in that world. It turned out there was pretty heavyweight processes to get these done because you needed data scientists for, for them. These were data scientists that were writing new algorithms that were processing your data using either TensorFlow or MaxNet or Cafe, any of the popular frameworks there. Um, but they were very, very heavyweight. And so what, what we were looking for was a mechanism such that every developer could be, make use of machine learning because it's such an important part of an organization like Amazon where we have very large corpuses of data and then actually would like to make use of the data to actually serve our customers better. And so, for example, we literally sit on billions of orders. And so you know which one of those orders in the past were fraudulent and which ones were not. And then you can make use of machine learning to make a model out of that. That if a new order comes in, that you can give it a score what the likelihood that this is also a fraudulent order. Yeah, and so this is all about sort of discovering patterns in that large data set that you then can use to give this new score. This is not that you then automatically reject that order, it then still goes to a uh, human investigator, but it sort of is augmenting humans. Important there is that we want every developer to do this. So we started developing services around that. And so with these new services, suddenly you no longer needed to be a data scientist to actually make use of machine learning. Everyone could do that. And we saw literally an explosion of hundreds of new applications happening within Amazon because of the use of machine learning. Yeah, and whether that is, uh, uh, for example, counterfeit good detection or sort of display ads and all sorts of other things that are really driven by machine learning. And we have literally tens of thousands of customers also running on AWS doing all this machine learning. And so with all of that, um, what have we learned actually from both the Amazon experiences as well from the experiences that we see at all these customers on AWS that are running machine learning is that machine learning needs a new stack because it really is getting outdated. No, nobody can operate anymore really at the level of the old data scientists, although we do need to support them, but we need to start looking at putting machine learning in the hands of everyone, including you as scientists and researchers. So, in essence, if you know what, they, what uh, machine learning is, it basically takes your data, you do a lot of, you run it through a number of algorithms, repeatedly with a whole set of different parameters until the accuracy that you get out of it is something that you're satisfied, then you create a model, you run that model somewhere, you can ask questions against it. And so you have new data then coming in, you can use that against the model and then do predictions uh, based on that model. Uh, just like I just said, uh, with, the, uh, with the, the order data set, you can sort of start making predictions whether new orders are actually fraudulent or not. Or it might be something else, it might be an abusive review detection mechanism. Yeah, things like that. There's whole things across the board that you can do with machine learning. So yeah, our mission for machine learning at uh, the AWS division is really to put it in the hands of every developer and every scientist. So for that, there's a few new pieces of the stack necessary. At the bottom, there's still the traditional frameworks that sort of the data scientists are, are using. Um, but on top of that, we've built a platform that makes it easy for everyone to use uh, these uh, machine learning algorithms. And then there's a whole set of services on top of that again uh, for if you don't even want to run those algorithms, but want to have a set of pre-built models that you can use, uh, we have those available for you as well. So let's take a look uh, a little bit deeper. So at the framework level, there still is all the work that normally the data scientists do. And if you've ever been doing machine learning, uh, you know this, these ones very well. Cafe, MXNet, TensorFlow are sort of the, uh, uh, the well-known uh, frameworks and interfaces out there that most data scientists use. And we run them on an infrastructure with uh, sort of the latest uh, uh, GPU boards uh, that you can have. It basically gives you a petaflight of compute per board um, with very with lots of different cores and very fast access to memory, so you can build all these graphs and networks very easily. 
Um, again, I think this is sort of the level where data scientists want to work. Yeah, you really want to tinker in creating new types of algorithms. But in reality, if you look what we really do in machine learning, what you do is actually you create your data sets, work hard on data quality, which is very unique and specific for uh, the particular data sets that you have, and it's very, that's something that is hard to help people with to get, we look at the data quality, but it depends a bit on the kind of data that you have. Um, you sort of lay out what kind of algorithms you want to use, uh, then you start to train, and basically training, in my eyes, is extremely dumb. It's basically running the same algorithms over and over and over and over again with a different set of parameters. And then the outcoming model, you pump some historical data into to see whether you can predict the, the past and then see how well, um, how well your model actually does with, data, with sort of your test set of data. And then once you have that model, you have to deploy it somewhere because you actually have to ask questions against it. Yeah, so this is what we do. In essence, I think 80% of machine learning has nothing to do with machine learning. It's just heavy lifting. It's just undifferentiated heavy lifting. You have to get your data somewhere. You have to repeatedly execute the same algorithm over and over again. Uh, you have to go back to your drawing board. And then you have to actually run it somewhere. All of these things are actually pretty hard to do. And so we, uh, we developed a, a system for that, for you to use there, a platform called Amazon SageMaker that basically takes all the heavy lifting out of machine learning uh, for you. Yeah, basically, what you do is you start off with, uh, in general, uh, a Jupyter uh, notebook where you sort of, in a few lines of Python, describe exactly what you want to do. You can use the, the notebook as your execution environment. You pick the algorithm that you want to have. Yeah, and so this is where the, the difference is with the data scientist. Yeah, the data scientist create new algorithm. Here, as, a, as, an, as an engineer, you basically pick the, the, the right algorithm that you want to use. Um, and we, we built very high performance ones uh, did, that were not available anywhere else. We call them streaming algorithms. Yeah, because in essence, data sets are getting larger and larger and larger. And so having to, when, for example, you get a new set of uh, satellite images or where uh, we get a new set of orders in, you do not want to retrain the whole data set. That will be very expensive, both in time as well as in money. And so we've been building these new algorithms for you to use where you can basically stream your data through and then checkpoint it and then basically start adding new data to, to it. To it. Um, so you pick the algorithm that you want to use, then with one click of a button you start the training um, and you can do this uh, optimization with all the, the, the parameters that you have until you get a model that you like and then again with one click of a button you can deploy it. Yeah, and deploying means basically putting it somewhere so that you can ask questions about it and whether you do that in real time like with one order coming in or you get this, this batch facilities there as well if you have massive amounts of batch that you want to push for your machine learning. Uh, model, you can do that as well. And so, you know, it might be that, for example, if you want to uh, detect objects or locations or faces and things like that in imagery, uh, you may pick a convoluted neural network. Um, K-means clustering is where you can use uh, sort of sales prediction, if that's what you want to do, or logistic re re regression. You pick just the algorithm that works best for you. The whole thing there is that all of that, yeah, the housing of the algorithms, the completely executing of it, and all of these model management, the things like that, you no longer have to worry about it in a new machine learning platform such as SageMaker is. And so that's what SageMaker basically gives you. It takes away all the heavy lifting for you around machine learning uh, to be able to execute um, your research. And of course I said, you know, I want to put it in the hands of every developer, but not even every, every developer needs to train new data sets. Now, there's many occasions where, for example, you just want to do image recognition. And so you may have a thousand images or 10,000 or maybe a million images that you just want to push through a, uh, a standard model. And for that, we've created a whole set of uh, application services for you. And whether that is image recognition or video recognition, all sorts of uh, things that you can do on there. Um, we have uh, mechanisms for speech to text and text to speech and automatic speech recognition, text processing, all of these services are available for you without having to become a machine learning expert. Yeah, and so if, if there's any of these are sort of of interest to you, urge you to go to ml.awes 
and you get all the details on actually how to get started there. Um, I, I'm going to close this off actually by uh, by talking to about another customer that we uh, that we have on the AWS platform, uh, and this is an organization that I, uh, I met last month with in Jakarta, and so they basically have. Uh, they're tackling one of the hardest problems there is, namely the generation of data. And how can we generate data that, um, how can we generate data from, let's say, the poorest farmers in the world who may not even have an identity, who may not have a computer, who definitely do not have a cell phone. How can we actually start generating data from that such that um, they get actually included in, in all sorts of opportunities for them? And so um, I'm very fortunate that I can, uh, can talk about these guys because I think it's sort of relevant for your world as well. After all, the targeting rice farmers, um, not only in Indonesia, but sort of around the world, uh, there's projects like this going on in, in Colombia and in Uganda and other places as, 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 as well. So um, they've built most of their systems around the technological blockchain. I'll skip that. Let's just say that that is a, uh, um, an indestructible ledger that you may have. So anything you put in this ledger can never be erased anymore, uh, which is important for identity, which is important for uh, sort of tra tractability of, of data over time and really finding the, the lineage of, of, of that. So Harold's mission is to really try to revolutionize the agriculture sector with data yeah, and sort of try and find mechanisms uh, and processes such that this data can actually be generated. And so um, if you look at sort of the, the, the challenges are, are huge in Indonesia. Yeah? And so there is hardly any information available about the poorest farmers in the world. And they're able, not able to actually really uh, produce and um, have as much access to resources as, as are available in many of the other countries around the world. Um, of course, this is uh, the, the things that I have on this slide is, is absolutely things that you in the room probably all know about. But much of this is actually driven around the lack of information and the lack of data available um, to any of the other players that might be interested in, 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 in this. And so they basically created a system that consists of four different stakeholders. Yeah? One is the data providers that is not necessarily the farmer itself. It is most likely an agent that operates in the neighborhood or the village and, and who actually has the Hara app on its uh, phone and actually collects all the data from the farmers, does uh, polygon tracking of the rice fields that they have, uh, tracks uh, 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 the, the yield of, uh, of, of the crop and things like that. Um, then there's data qualifiers that basically look at the data and actually validate that this data is co correct and, and actually is in line with other, other data that you're seeing. And then there's data buyers. And the data buyers in their particular case are, uh, for example, banks and insurance companies. Yeah, there's many of, the, uh, many of the farmers actually really have no access to financial resources at all. Yeah, and, and given that there is almost there's no identity, there's hardly any information about the effectiveness of, uh, of the farmer. And so it's very hard for them to actually um, get access to loans. Most of them will have to go to loan sharks, which actually charge something like 2.5% a month for them. And so given that uh, now with all of these mechanisms, um, they're actually both their, their identity is created as well as sort of being tracked uh, there in, in their fields, um, they now have the ability to actually get access to this data um, through the data sources that they provide and now actually gives, you, uh, gives those uh, data buyers uh, the ability to start providing loans and micro loans uh, to individuals in ways that they, uh, that they could never do. Yeah, so these are the, the typical numbers. Actually, the majority of them do not have a bank account. Uh, mostly because they have no identity whatsoever. Uh, many of them are actually have to borrow money and actually have to borrow money to actually be able to do their job. Now, it turns out that working with these financial institutions and this data that comes directly from these farmers, uh, these loans that are actually being uh, uh, produced 
is, uh, is actually sort of the, the repayment on the loans that are getting, the, the micro loans that are getting now to these farmers almost have a repayment rate of 100%. Mostly because I think the, the interest rates on that are something like 0 0.003 a month instead of the two and a half that the loan sharks are actually giving them. Yeah, it's also actually really tracking all of this. Um, the, re the high repayment rates make that um, sort of these data sets are becoming increasingly important for everyone uh, in Indonesia because it really drives uh, access from, this, from the farmers to things like insurance and to things like uh, micro loans. And this, this, this is another, suddenly the whole misuse of farm subsidies can be tracked because now suddenly data is available from all these, uh, from all these farmers in an immutable way. So you really know that this data is actually data that has been generated by the farmer and not by anybody else. Um, these farmers, of course, in each initially cannot be necessarily incentivized by uh, sort of the future promise of a loan. Actually, they get incentivized through a, uh, through a loyalty point system, which is actually really simple. Basically, you get a stamp card that every time the data gets collected about your farm, you get a, a stamp on it. And once you collect enough stamps, you can actually use this to buy fertilizer and to buy farm equipment and things like that. So there is an incentive to actually start contributing this data that is actually immediately impacting farmers to, 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 to today. So I think this is an amazing system of, uh, of actually try, trying to use out-of-band mechanisms to start creating data sets that can be increasingly important for us understanding uh, really how uh, the, the poorest farmers in the world are actually farming their rice. Yeah, and the same goes for the future idea of that. If we have this te technology available, it makes it much easier for these farmers uh, to actually participate in IoT projects uh, that may be creating actually data on an automatic fashion instead of having these agents running around uh, drawing these polygons or looking at the, 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 the crop yield. Yeah, and so with all of that, this new data actually combining with uh, all sorts of other research data and satellite imagery now creates a whole large data set um, that, that is unparalleled in this world and hopefully can drive a whole lot in future work on uh, precision agriculture and the likes. Yeah, and I think uh, we're really proud again that uh, at AWS we're able to support an organization like this that truly has access to um, um, that truly gives data access to every one of the poorest farmers in the world. So with that, thank you for your attention. I hope you picked up something from this. Um, I've truly enjoyed being here. Thank you.